Hi, I'm Amber, and welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today, we have a special guest with us, Denise Grzynski. She is a family nurse practitioner. She is a, a children's author, and she has a blog, and she is an advocate for pet adoption. And she's going to talk to us about diabetes in dogs. Welcome, Denise. Thank you so much for having me, Amber. I'm excited to be here to talk. We have a lot in common. Yes, indeed. So let's get down to it. I'm really excited to, to talk about this because I feel it's so incredibly important. Okay, give us a little bit of background on you. Like, what do you do? And how did you get interested in the whole diabetes thing? And tell us a little bit about Harley. Yeah, so I have been a nurse practitioner since 1999. I graduated from nursing school in 94. Um, my career has been fairly diverse. I worked for Carnival Cruise Lines for a little while um, mm. as a nurse practitioner. And I got into family practice when I was living in Rhode Island. I discovered I had loved to travel. And so I did kind of travel nursing, travel nurse practitioning in combination for a while. And I started out with the Narragansett Indian Health Center in Rhode Island. And um, the, that population has a lot of diabetes. And so that's kind of where I initially started learning more and more and more. I worked with a wonderful nurse practitioner who was so able to kind of boil it down and make it easier to understand. Although diabetes is still quite complicated. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and then I, while I was in Florida, which is before Rhode Island. So I kind of took a step backwards, but I, I rescued Harley. So that was my first rescue dog that was all on my own. Um, that was separate from having an animal with my parents. We had always had animals growing up, but he was all mine. Mm -hmm. And so he, he ended up, I got, I ended up being told while we were in Rhode Island that he was a bit overweight and I was given some instructions on dog food and put him on the dog food that was recommended and, you know, went on my merry way. And a few years later, I called up my vet because I said, Harley's drinking a lot of water. He's urinating more frequently. He's having urinary accidents. And he was potty trained. I said, in a human, because that's where my experience was in a human, that's diabetes. What's that in a dog? And the vet said, diabetes, bring him in. So his blood sugars were over 400 when I brought him in. And I remember thinking then, and it started me down this path, although it was still another three years before I wrote his story. Um, he told me when I brought him in, I can't tell you how many pet parents don't know the symptoms. And by the time they bring in their animal, we have to put them down because it's too late. Their organs are in shutdown. And I thought my heart broke. I, I almost started crying in the office just because number one, you're stressed because your animal is ill. And number two, oh my goodness, the thought that I might have brought him in too late and had to put him down. I just, I thought I never want a pet parent to experience that. Mm -mm. So, and again, I got prescribed dog food, a new dog food that was diabetic related. And ironically, I, we were having a really horrible time managing his blood sugars. They were just all over the place too high. Couldn't get him back down. We kept upping his insulin. He's, he's not a tea, He wasn't a teacup. He was a standard Yorkie. So he was about 13 pounds. But when we got up to like six or seven units of insulin twice a day, I was like, this just doesn't feel right. And so I started doing research on food. And the first thing I noticed was that the main primary filler in my diabetic dog food was ground beets, okay. which is sugar. <laughs> and I thought, well, this doesn't seem right. So I started doing more research and I ended up, um, I'm trying to think of what the whole pet diet might be the book I landed on. Um, but I ended up reading and just doing tons and tons of research and discovering a lot of things, which I'm sure you're, you have been learning as well. Mm -hmm. I discovered more about dog food than I 
I know more about dog nutrition than I know about human nutrition, which is kind of <laughs> sad considering that's what I still do for a living, but that's very um, common though. <laughs> and when I went to my vet and I said, look, I think part of the problem with controlling his sugars is related to his food. She called the company and the company said, tell her to stop picking apart the food. And uh-uh. I looked at my vet, my eyes got really big and I looked at my mm-hmm. vet and she just goes, Denise, it's okay. You go figure out what you're going to feed him and just come back and tell me, I know you're going to do your research. I will not make more suggestions. Just you go do your thing and let me know what it is. And that's when I started totally completely revamping his diet. I was just looking over here because I had a can of dog food for the longest time sitting on my desk because I did a, uh, a, a video on the pet food because after I really examined what was going on and now knowing what I know about nutrition, I was horrified, absolutely oh, yeah. horrified. And that was some of the best stuff that we could find. And, you know, that's what we did. We, we said, oh, you know, you got to look for, for this and you don't want this in there. Okay. That's all fine. But there's like a crap ton of other stuff in there that is just horrifying now that I know the difference. Right. Yeah. I'm infuriated with that. And I don't know about you, but for me, I felt such incredible guilt when I found out that my dog had diabetes and I know that it was caused from the crap food, even though we tried to do the best we could find (laughs) the thought that I did that to my dog. Mm -hmm. And when We'll, we'll get to the symptoms here in a minute, but with, with my dog, the, she had some symptoms and we were kind of watching them. And we were like, this is kind of odd behavior, but we were just kind of keeping an eye on it. The next thing, you know, and this was in a short period of time, we threw a, a treat at her and it hit her in the head. And that dog, does, she's a chocolate lab. She hmm. doesn't miss treats like ever, <laughs> right. ever. Right. And we were kind of like, what the heck? And then we started doing some other stuff. She couldn't see. Mm -hmm. Our dog was blind. The same thing happened to Harley very, very quickly. Because if you don't don't get their blood sugars under control really quickly, they lose it. He grew cataracts really quickly. I mean, I think within four months, it was quick. He wasn't able to see anymore either. Yeah, that's horrifying. But the guilt, I feel extreme guilt, especially doing what I do. Mine went all the way back to the weight when I started thinking about it, cause I thought, did my, did the food I feed, fed him, feed him the food I fed him all the way back then, did that help shut his pancreas down? And it, I mean, it could have. So yeah, the guilt is overwhelming. Cause they trust you. They're mm-hmm. trusting you to take care of them. Oh, they and are I the felt... epitome of unconditional love. They yes. just, it's, <sighs> we can we do cried, no wrong in their girl. eyes. Yeah we cried and cried. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's like, I should know better. This is what I do. And why wouldn't I think that applied to my dog? I mean, come on, but yeah. And so now I am like, I want to get this out. So people understand that it's not okay to feed your dogs grains and beets and, you know, sugar filled stuff that it does nothing for their nutrition. I mean, it's just filler. It's, it's cheap. It's, and some of the stuff is downright poison. Yes. I'm like, oh, it's just, well, they feed them. I mean, they can put into dog food, what is not human grade fit for consumption. That's right. So, I mean, it can be, I have heard horror stories about roadkill making it into dog food. I mean, <sighs> diseased animals, diseased chickens, diseased, diseased meat, you know, it, it, that's a byproduct is a huge key phrase right there in front of your, in front of the meat. Yeah. And it's, that's just, dis- that's devastating. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all read the back of the pet food and look at the list of ingredients. Honestly, 
they're a dog, you know, <laughs> they, they're like a wolf in the wild. Do you think they're going to be chawing on grain and beets and stuff? Probably not. They're going to go after the meat. That's what their, their, you know, bodies are meant for. And uh, that is, oh, it, it just frustrates me to no end that they get away with this. But then right. again, look what, what they're doing to humans, the potato yeah. chips and cookies and, oh, eat more grains and all that. So why, why not do that with dogs too? Right. I mean, I mean you hear about like in, in the, some of the food that comes from China, you mm-hmm. know, they've had some issues. Yeah. You know about stuff like that. And they have the recalls and some horrifying things. I, I read a bunch of that and I probably shouldn't have because it just scared the crap out of me. But uh, yeah. So you hear about that, but it's everything. Even the fresh food. Have you read the ingredients on the fresh food that you buy in the, you know, in the mm-hmm. tubes? Yeah, really? I know. And I'm still, you know, it's still so hard because, but you know, one of the hacks to saving money, because even, you know, you do your best and you, mm-hmm. you spend the money and I'll admit, I'm the first one to admit I'm not feeding raw. Although I, although I, I should be after all I know. I should be doing it. I should be spending the time to do it. It is also one of the hacks for taking care of a diabetic dog, because if you want to save money, you can spend money on this really high end food. It's still not going to be the best. The Mm -hmm. best is really when you know exactly what grains go into it. And my husband would laugh at me that I'm out here promoting raw feeding because he'd be like, so you're going to do it. Are you <laughs> going to take the time to do it? Um, but, and you have to do it right. You have to be very, very careful when you do it. Um, but it, it's a way to save money and it's a way to know exactly what's going into your food. And I have a friend, Kimberly, yeah, absolutely. keep the dog wagging, keep the dog wagging, keep the tails wagging. Give me just a second. I'm going to actually cheat. <laughs> keep the tail wagging. <laughs> I'll, and I'll she, put a link below. I'll put yeah, a link below. She is a raw feeder and she does it right. She does it in batches. She does it kind of probably the best and easiest way you can possibly do it. So yeah, I, I, I'm definitely going to check her out. I mean, I do feed my dog raw because after mm-hmm. I found that out, I was like, oh no, this yes. is not going to continue. So immediately we, we started feeding our dog raw and, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm not doing it perfectly. I don't know. It gives but, you a lot of control though. It really does mm-hmm. because then you're not the, the sugar. I mean, you're, it's still with the pancreas and the way it works and everything. And it's still, they're going to be variable and you're going to have times where it's more difficult to control. Um, another little hack in that sense, because my vet would have them come in and they want to do glucose curves. So have you had to do one of those? Yes, I have. And matter of fact, we're probably going to have to take her in to have another one. Mm -hmm. We kind of discussed this earlier, but I'll get into it a little bit later when I ask you a question, but um, Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. The glucose curve we have done. So I, I did them at home. My vet actually let me do them at home. It was, I mean, given it's kind of for Harley, at least I had to check his blood sugar underneath his lip just at his tooth. Oh, so I had to poke his mouth. I couldn't ever oh. get it from, sometimes you can do an ear. Where do you check your dog's sugar uh, on, on the paw that, on the that paw. rough, right. That little rough, whatever mm-hmm. you call that. Yeah. Yeah. The pad part or whatever yeah. it's called. I could never use any of those spots on Harley. I always oh. had to use his inner lip. Oh. So it was pretty hard to yeah. do that, but my vet charged me $20 and 50, this is back in 2010, $20 and something plus per stick for each one of those glucose curves. And for those of you that don't know what a glucose curve is, you start off fasting in the morning and then about, and then you feed in about every two hours, you're doing a blood sugar for an entire day so that you're literally watching their glucose curve. Um, And what we found out was happening with Harley was that he was actually dropping low. So part of the reason we couldn't get his blood sugars under control was because he was, he was bottoming out. And so then the body holds on to sugar, right? And you as a nutrition person probably can actually talk through this even better than I can, but then the body holds on to sugar. So then you're spiking, you have the spikes. Mm -hmm. So you're dropping low and then you're spiking. And then when you're checking just randomly, 
it's, you've got these high levels. So that's what they're looking for with the glucose curve too. They're looking to see, are they dropping too low and then spiking? And do we, we ended up dropping his insulin. So we had gone all the way up to six units twice a day. We ended up down to two units twice a day. A part of that was changing his diet. And part of that was figuring out that it was, it was the Samoji effect, which is what the name for that is. Mm. Uh, Yeah. Like we were talking earlier, my dog is going through something again. We kind of had her stabilized and her sugars were, were pretty decent. And then all of a sudden she started having these weird symptoms again, where we initially found out she was diabetic. She started doing that again. And we're like, what? And so we kept an eye on her, but she just progressively got worse. We tested her. She had a glucose over 600 and when we talked to the vet, the vet was like, oh yeah, we might want to do a, a blood sugar curve on that. And, but the problem we have with our dog is she stresses out when she goes to the vet, completely stresses mm-hmm. out. And what happens when you have stress? What happens to your blood? Like, ah, yeah. And I found <laughs> that out because I got me a little uh, CGM right here. I'm doing oh, some, yeah. uh, some, uh, just research on myself. I'm not diabetic uh-huh. or anything, but just, just for myself, but yeah. And, and it would spike like crazy when she was at the vet because she's blind, she's scared, she's stressed. And right. so her blood sugars were like 700. It was crazy. But when we got home <laughs> after she tilt for a bit, it dropped way low. So it was like this crazy thing anyway she's going through it again so the vet said that there's a possibility she now has Cushing's and if you have that it's almost impossible to get your blood sugar under control unless you until you start treating the Cushing's and until we're like Cushing's get treated oh really again right. um, she's already blind she's diabetic good gosh we changed her to raw you know and it's yeah. like Oh, the damage we did. I mean, we've had her since she was a little tiny puppy. And, you know, if I would have started feeding her correctly back then. (sighs) But that's what we do to ourselves. Cause look, you're doing what you, you're doing everything you can do now. Mm -hmm. You switched your diet, you're doing all the right things. And sometimes the body just doesn't want to, you know, sometimes the body needs another tweak. Yeah. We see it in humans all the time too. So you know, it's, it's as tough as it is and as hard as it is. And, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. Cause like I said, I can still think back over Mm. guilt over multiple, multiple things and multiple different ways that I could have handled things with Harley differently, other things I could have done. Um, but it it doesn't do, it doesn't do us any good to do it to ourselves. That's for sure. I have a question Mm. though, because you've got that monitor. Cause I read something in the midst of trying to update myself on what current more current treatment is. I had heard that you can get one of those continuous glucometers for your pet. No way. I I read it somewhere. I don't know. I read it. I haven't read it. I I don't know. That would be, I I bet that's pricey. Oh, I bet it is because it is for it's, it's, it's hard enough to get it covered right now for a human. Like, yeah, I would like yeah. every single diabetic human that I have to have one of those monitors. Can right? I tell you how much it changes their diet? <laughs> yeah. You can talk till you're blue in the face mm-hmm. and explain what diet and exercise will do to help yep. a diabetic. And until they look at that continuous glucometer and watch what what they put in their mouth does to their sugar, what exercise will do to their sugar. It really makes every, yeah, Yeah. it makes all the difference for them to watch it. But I am fascinated. You are going to have to keep me posted. Oh, definitely. (laughs) I really want to know that would have been a game changer. Yeah. So I am very curious. I think Everyone, I don't care who they are, everyone should have one of these att- attached to their arm. And as they're eating that cookie and eating those potato chips and, oh, it's not bad for you. Carbs are fine. Mm, yeah. I would like everybody to experience that and see that firsthand because until it's in your face, you just, uh, oh, no, it doesn't bother me because I'm not having any symptoms and I haven't been diagnosed. Huh. That doesn't mean you're not, you're healthy just because you weren't diagnosed, right? Right. You know that. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, what's I'm going healthy. on inside your body? Even your diabetic. You're like, well, mm-hmm. I don't feel anything. So my blood sugar exactly. being at 350 is not a big deal. I'm like, oh mm-hmm. yes, it is. Yeah. And, yes, and is. then they, they're not diagnosed until later. And some are never diagnosed. 
Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. Th- right. Th- and that's scary. And, and like dogs too, because they can't tell you. Mm-mm. And so you just kind of notice something is off, but you're like, oh, they're just really thirsty or whatever in the panting. And okay, before we go too far, okay. um, let's go over some symptoms that you see in a diabetic dog or before mm-hmm. they're full blown di- diabetic. What can people look for? So you start looking for them drinking more water. You start looking for them. You're needing to go out to use the restroom more. And I'm going to do another cheat because there were some extra symptoms. Those were the main ones that I saw um, were that I had seen weight loss is another one, but it can also be weight gain. So significant changes in weight. Right. Um, And then if they're getting chronic infections, because when sugars are high, Mm -hmm. Uh, you, they, you get infections specifically urinary tract infections are, are a really big thing. Although mm. I would hope your vet would notice that there's a lot of sugar in the urine when they test the urine. But as you know, we've got to be our own advocates in our own healthcare. And so definitely have to be that for our dogs. And thank kids. you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> you must be your own advocate for health. And, you do. And, and I, I think it's, pets. I mean, I really wish that it wasn't that way as a healthcare provider. I wish it wasn't that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I wish that everybody was out there trying to do preventative medicine, um, for their patients, but it's not, that's not, although we're headed more in that direction, Yes, we yes, are yes. finally headed that way. Um, but you do have to be your own advocate. You have mm-hmm. to do research in It was a, that was exactly what it was for me with a dog as well. Uh, Okay. So what are some other symptoms? I'm going to list one that I noticed. I don't know if this is on your list or not, Mm -hmm. but my dog started panting, like constant panting. And it, she wasn't doing anything. It wasn't like she was running around the yard. She would just be laying there panting and it's not hot. And she's doing that right now. Well, and fatigue too, right? So if they, if they're not wanting to get up and they're not wanting to do all of the things that they usually do, especially if you have a younger dog, that's really, really active. It's a bit harder in an older dog that's starting to slow down, but fatigue is the same thing. It's, it's, so I don't know where the panting, the phys, like, I'm trying to think in my mind about the pathophysiology behind the panting, but just like humans are different. So are animals. Yeah. So you get to know your animal. I, I think that the most important, one of the most important things you can advocate for, for pet parents is know your animal. Because then when you yeah. see something change, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't matter if it's a symptom. I, I tell my patients this all the time. It doesn't matter if that's a side effect. That's a known side effect. If we can tell if that's your side effect, that's your side effect, or that's your symptom. And it's the same thing for pets and then children. I really tie this into kids as well, because kids are really not able to tell us like our dogs. They're not able to tell us when something is wrong. Right. Um, You know, my kids, we've got four children through adoption, they're siblings and they are as of February 5th, they are four, five, six, and seven. And they literally will say, mommy, my tummy hurts or mommy, my head hurts, but that could be, they're hungry. That could, you know, you, you just, they're thirsty, Mm -hmm. their head hurts. They need, okay. You didn't drink enough water today. Um, so kind of like our dogs, our kids are very similar with that, where we have to watch. That's very true. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. The painting, I'm not really sure what that's about, but I'll tell you something else that I found interesting. Like I said, I have a chocolate lab and mm-hmm. that dog likes to eat and just, that's all she cares about eat, 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 and, and, and playing with a ball, you know, fetch. So mm-hmm. eat, eat, fetch, eat, eat, fetch, fetch, eat. <laughs> oh, you got food. Here I am. <laughs> and this morning she actually left her bowl and to go drink water big sign, like what you're saying, know your dog. And that I was like, um, yeah, that's not normal. And then she ate a little bit of it and then she walked away and she, you could tell she was like, even she was shocked, you know, mm-hmm. like what she is kept going, going back there? thinking maybe something will yeah. be different this time when I go yeah. back. 
Yeah. And it, and it's raw food. She loves her. She loves any food, but she really likes the, the raw. I mean, that mm-hmm. has just been her thing. And it took like quite a while. And I'm telling you that sucker, she will scar something down in like 30 seconds. So wow. for her to do that, I was like, whoa, that's, that's a not- really, really big sign for you then. For yeah. Her. Yeah. Yeah. So know your pets, know your pets. Yes. Yes. And, and, and you kind of have it in your gut, you know, but you're, because you know, it's a, it's your aunt, your pet, you're kind of like, oh, well, you know, maybe it's just whatever. And let's just watch and see if something changes. <sighs> yeah. And then sometimes yeah. it's just too late. Yeah. And that's what you don't want to do, right? No. You don't want to wait till it's too late. No. And that's why I wanted to have you on to mm-hmm. bring more attention, more awareness to this. And what I think is extremely sad is that diabetes in dogs, cats too, is not uncommon. Mm-mm. Not at all. It's why? crazy, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Could it be the same issue that we have with humans? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, crap food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But very people don't much think so. about it, and mm-hmm. I, I didn't either. And I know, but I should know better. That's what I just want to. Mm, you know, it's like I should know better. You know, right. <laughs> but I know the feeling. Yeah. So the people who don't know better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they just go in the store and they're like, "Oh, this says it's you know the best pet food in the whole world, so this must be good stuff." Right. Or they see it advertised on TV. Yeah. And they think because it's advertised on TV that that makes it okay. Oh, don't even get me started with media. (laughs) (laughs) Right. 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 (laughs) Because we know what it does to humans. So (laughs) yes, yes. It's terrible, terrible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, okay. I just had something in my head. I was going to ask and now it went by, um, Okay. Let me, let me, I'm going to have to think here. Oh, let's go ahead and move to this one. How do you treat diabetes in a dog? What is the treatment for that? So my understanding for dogs is, is that it's only insulin, but I, I've been, again, I've been trying to do research because it's hard. It's been since 2013. So let me know if anything's changed. Cause obviously you're currently treating a dog with diabetes, but at the time of Harley's diagnosis, I was told cats can sometimes get medicine and usually dogs get insulin. Mm. But if you, if you liken it to humans, right, it depends on what's going on. So if your pancreas is shut down, then that's going to require insulin because your pancreas isn't making insulin. And it's mm. the same for a dog. Um, but if their if their blood sugars are off and they're still obese, that's mm-hmm. the same as a human. Often, t- then your body's not able to utilize the insulin that it's already making, and so there's a possibility that while you work on diet and exercise for a dog, all those lifestyle things we talk about for humans, I guess it's a it's foreseeable a possibility in my mind that there might be a medication for a dog to use. But when he was diagnosed, yeah, when he was diagnosed, I was told that's not the case, that that it always requires insulin. Okay. Let me ask you this. Okay. Since you are a nurse practitioner and you understand the difference between type one and type two, Mm -hmm. one, one is where your pancreas is shut down and it's not producing. You have to have exogenous insulin Mm -hmm. where type two, you can reverse it if you haven't shut down your pancreas from having it go too long. And and so, you know, you can reverse that through diet and et cetera, a good portion of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. We were, or or my husband actually was doing some research on this. And he said that when a dog gets diabetes, it's more like a human's type one. That's my understanding. Okay. That is my understanding as well. And so unless something had, that's again, I'm always putting that disclaimer on it since I'm not a vet, I'm a human (laughs) practitioner. Um, and I don't currently have a dog with diabetes, so it's harder to stay current on all of the treatments, but that is my understanding is, is that it's more like a type one. Yeah. Um, I I don't know how true that really is, but I could see where that would happen because if you let it go, because they can't tell you, 
And, mm-hmm. and once you start seeing those severe signs that make you take notice, it's probably too late. Yeah. So the, pro- the, the pancreas probably was already damaged and then they're not producing insulin. So yeah, I type one. So it does make sense. I just find that really sad that diet alone couldn't reverse it like it does in humans. Well, type two humans. Right. Right. And no, I know. I think, I think like you said, I mean, again, it's kind of conjecture, but I think that by the time we notice it in pets, even when we're really aware, you still, I mean, if I had to go back and I had to think about it, he probably was symptomatic for a little while before I called my vet. Well, I think that's true. That's true in humans too, because they just kind of put it out of their mind, you know, like, oh, well, that's just nothing. That's nothing. And and then you just get used to it and it becomes your normal. And then something else comes up and you brush that off because it's not that major. Mm-hmm. But if you look back and you're like, oh gosh, that would probably, yeah, that was probably when it started. And if I would have done something at that point, maybe things would have been different. Right. And the same with the same with your dog, but I think it takes longer to get to that point because again, they can't tell you what they're feeling right. inside. It's just something's not right. And mm-hmm. you can tell in their attitude that they, they don't understand either, but they know something's not right. You can almost see that. And it's like, how did I not pick up on that a lot sooner? Right. Well, and I can say the same thing about Harley know. with his shots, because you know, people will always say, so, you know, did he run away from you then? Did he start running from you? I'm like, actually he came really easily for his insulin shots. So I honestly think that he knew that it made him feel better. And in his story, I say that. I think he knew he felt better. Yep. I have one of the little needles. Yep. And, And they're like hair thin. Then. Well, and you and I used, we used to give it to him in the nape of his neck. I don't know yes, where you give yes. it. Yes. Scruff. So, yeah. yeah. So the scruff right there. So, you know, if you think about a dog, that's where their moms used to carry them, right? They mm-hmm. used to grab them and carry them mm-hmm. so they can handle that. So you pull up that scruff and that's where you give the injection. It, mm-hmm. it didn't, he didn't yelp. He came, you could Mm-mm. say, Harley, it's time for your shot. And he would come mm-hmm. running for his shot. So did you give him a treat after I didn't? Oh, okay. See, I, I, I admit I do pork rinds. So <laughs> she'll get a little pork rind. <laughs> yeah. There, and that's, I mean, that's really, I was probably a mean owner, like here, come get a shot and I'm not going to give you anything for it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe because our, our pets know, like you can tell when you're, when you're a pet parent is what I like to call it. Cause I think it's really important too, when you're choosing a vet, I experienced this with my next rescue that had Cushing's and arthritis. Um, I really had to search for the right vet because I, it's not that they're not, it's not that they're bad vets, but I feel like there's vets that are vets for pet parents where the pet Mm -hmm. is part of your family and you're willing to go to these links to help your pets. And then there are farm vets and, you know, we live in Texas, so There are, there are farm vets, right? So yes. And, and with a farm animal, when something went wrong, you put the animal down, you didn't go to all these links. And what I found with my arthritis, with my arthritic dog, again, I started crying. I was at a conference for pet bloggers and I listened to the aha lecture. So animal, I have to look it up to find out what aha all stands for, but there's a, there's a certification that a vet's office can get. Um, it's expensive in order to get it. And some vet's offices will be up to that standard, but haven't got the certification. Um, but one of the things is in pain management Mm. and because I wanted aqua therapy and laser therapy I wanted stuff like that for my arthritic dog. I just, I didn't want you to just throw tramadol at my dog and then look at me. Like I was trying to ask for pain medication for my dog. Cause that was, that was the other kind of look I got was, (laughs) so are you going to be using the medication or what? I'm like, for goodness sakes, I just want my dog to feel better. Um, and none of that was offered to me until I found an AHA certified vet. Yeah. So now when I move to a new location, that's what I look for. I look for a vet's office that has it. Our, our vet, our, 
they sold their business not too long ago, but our vets, they were two brothers. They graduated from A&M, vet school A&M, mm-hmm. and they were just super cool. They were kind of no nonsense and uh, they, they didn't, you know, try to force you to do things that for no reason. They just gave it to you like it is. I remember them telling me when my cat had a, her kidneys shut down and we don't have any clue why she, she was young. It made no sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was just like, bam, that quick. And he just said, look, here's the blood test. We can right. do this, this, and this, but I'm just going to tell you that will only prolong the life for like another, you know, <laughs> couple of days. <laughs> I was like, right. okay. Well, and I like that to talk to you like that. As yeah, well. I do too. I mean, it's too. important to I, have that. I did like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I yeah. did a blog post on that. Um, finding a vet is like dating, <laughs> like serial dating. Yeah. Although kind of like you said, with the guilt, I have this problem where I go somewhere and I become loyal instantaneously without much, <laughs> I need to do my research before I get there because (laughs) once I've met you face to face, I have a really hard time saying I'm going to move on now. I'm like that too. It's like, you feel like you're betraying, you know, it's a betrayal, Mm -hmm. but, but, but just like a doctor, that's me with doctors. I, I, I don't trust. I, I've always had a fear. I have white coat syndrome, whatever you want to say. And I avoided it gosh, I avoided doctors. I, I'm terrible about that. And, uh, you know, the vets are the same way because they're, you know, working with a part of your family, or at least yes. that's the way I feel you should. That's how I pets. feel as well. Yeah. <laughs> I think of it now, now that I'm all this, all these years through multiple dogs with health issues, I think of it. And now I have kids, which I didn't have before. I think this is how I would find a pediatrician. Yes. Would I, would I let a pediatrician that I wasn't real happy with their service continue to see my kids? And I, heck no, I don't know if I can say that on (laughs) (laughs) you say whatever. (laughs) No, I would not. So, and I shouldn't feel guilty from people who don't understand that pet parenting mentality. Cause there are people that don't. Yeah. Um, but my pet, my, I've got a furry family. We are this Grzynski super seven. <laughs> and that's the seventh is the, fa- is the fur family member. So it's, that's the way our family is. That's the way we work. And, you know, I'm going to treat my dog the same way. And I, there are people that get very offended by that, but my dog is, is another one of my kids. Yeah. I, I, and I, I, I get that. I do. Um, let, let's, let's, Back up just a minute. I just want to make sure that we get this in there. You you spoke of ways you can save money. Mm -hmm. Go over that a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to, again, for those of you that are watching us on YouTube, I'm going to (laughs) look at my little hacks. So they say that the cost to take care of a diabetic dog ranges right between like 40 and four and $200, depending on the month, depending on the week. Um, so there's a first hack. Don't fall for the APR credit card. So the credit card that your vet's office offers you, um, I wouldn't do that. Now I would look into pet insurance, but not after the diagnosis of diabetes. And I just recommend researching it. I still don't have pet insurance because what we decided to do was a a pet savings account. Mm. That um, oftentimes pet insurances, at least in the past, they don't cover pre-existing conditions. So when you think about humans and pets and insurance and pre-existing conditions, um, they tend to not cover them. So what was recommended actually, uh, uh, back in 2010 was that we opened up a separate savings account and the money, the premium that I would have been putting into a pet insurance, I started putting into that savings account. And then I can use it for preventative medicine. I can use it for their food. I can use it for, you know, you can use it for whatever you need to use it for. Obviously make sure you have a set amount. Cause as you and I both know, when the animal is ill, um, you're going to spend quite a bit out of that savings. Account. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's one of the hacks for, for cost. Another hack is to purchase your insulin online. Cause insulin can be very, very expensive. Um, and sometimes you can even find discount cards. Um, hmm, he was small. I didn't know that. 
so he was small, right? Two units. How many units do you have to give your lab? Because it's a lot more than that. Tonight, 20. Yeah. Twice a day. Yeah. And so most insulin vials are going to be 100 <laughs> units, right? So mm -hmm. you're going to hit that really fast in a $90 insulin bottle. Yeah. So um, purchasing online, using generic instead of brand, sometimes asking your, because I don't, do you get yours from the, from a human pharmacy? No, uh, through the vet. Okay. So the vet sometimes can help as well. Um, but sometimes changing a manufacturer hmm. and sometimes changing a benefits plan, sometimes not going through the vet and going through a farm, a human pharmacy will also save you money. Huh? But it depends on, are you using human insulin or are you using the special vet insulins? Do you know? I think, I think it's specifically designed for dogs. For the dogs. Human. Okay. I believe so. So you can ask your vet what it would be, you know, the difference for you, because the vet can talk you through. I can't remember what the insulin's called when it's specific. We used human insulin for first Harley. So mm -hmm. I got it through the, the human pharmacy. And then you can oftentimes find other discounts for it. So oh. that's just a hack. It's, and you have to, by all means talk, you know, you got to do it with your vet. Um, especially when it's a vet you trust. So, um, and then insulin can be used again, talk to your vet. I'm not a veterinarian, <laughs> but insulin can oftentimes be used for a little longer than what they say the vial is for mm -hmm. somebody like myself, who is only using two, two units twice a day, a hundred unit vial lasted quite yeah. a while. So that's, you know, if you, if I was having to buy it every month, that would have been very expensive, but I used it beyond that. Having said that I was also doing blood sugar checks at home. So if the insulin wasn't working, I was going to know that. Hmm. So if something yeah. had happened to the, to the shelf life of the insulin, um, syringes are another cost, as you know, the glucose meter mm -hmm. and the testing strips, um, mm -hmm. I gave myself a note about looking into the freestyle Libra because you can see, I know that they're expensive, but you only change out if you can use it, which I don't know if you can, but if you can use it, um, you only change out that about every 14 days. Yes. I think the sensor, right? Yes. So that's possibly, and then using the glucose, doing the glucose curve at home, asking if you can asking your vet, can I do this glucose curve at home and bring you in the numbers? Yeah. And then that, feeding raw. Okay. That's what I want to get into a little bit more about the raw. Um, what we do, th this is how I, I feed my dog and I'm going to check into your website just to kind of, or my friends, yeah. Friends <laughs> website. My website's not going to help you with raw feeding. Just FYI. <laughs> Well, you never know. You want to go to Kimberly's <laughs> website because she'll, she'll give you all the good, good information on it. We go to, well, my husband goes to Sam's and he buys one of them honking huge things of the hamburger meat you know, mm -hmm. they, they're like this. And that lasts quite a while. So, so that's very inexpensive for the bulk of the food, the base of the food. And mm -hmm. then I get like chicken feet, uh, chicken livers, kidney chicken gizzards, uh, sometimes chicken, uh, liver, um, what else? Um, I'll, I'll do different stuff like that and, and mm -hmm. kind of mix it, mix it in and change it out is what I mean. Like kind of mm -hmm. rotation, uh, like a rotating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. There you go. And, uh, I seem to be okay, but uh, I'm going to double check on that. And, uh, you know, eggs, I'll crack an egg with the shell, the, mm -hmm. the, the good organic eggs, whatever mm -hmm. that are, that are not your typical cheap stuff because they say the shells are different, but they need that calcium. So I'll crunch up the whole egg in the bowl. And, uh, one dog likes it. The other dog's like, I am not licking up shells. <laughs> so she'll <laughs> so like does he, lick Do they eat everything it. around it and then leave the shells in the bowl? She does. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how they do that. Cause you think oh, about yeah. that stuff all ground in there. You're like, how do you actually pick out this little shell? <laughs> or like a pill when you give them a pill and then you're like, I'm just going to mix it in. No problem. Uh, that yeah. stupid, stupid pill will still be in the bowl. They're not dumb. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's so frustrating. <laughs> like, those pill pockets, right? They, I mean, I know they're, they've got a lot of unhealthy things in them, but mm -hmm. the pill pocket you put, I, I never could use those because my dog would eat everything around it and leave the pill. 
Yes. What I do is I get a pork rind. I, my dog mm-hmm. loves pork rinds, but I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. I will take a, she also has thyroid issues and she's had that for a long time. So she has to take thyroid medicine too. So mm-hmm. yeah, we spend a lot of money on uh, medicine for, for our mm-hmm. one dog, but I, I'll like kind of bore it into the, the pork rind and she mm-hmm. just home and it's gone. So <laughs> there's yeah. not a problem with that. Yeah. Bearing them in. And again, this is probably from a, from a nutrition standpoint, not the best thing in the world, but if I cut up a hot dog and I stick it in the middle of a hot dog, that looks, works a lot better than a pill pocket. Wow. Hey, that's a good idea too, but you can buy good hot dogs that that's are, true. don't have a bunch of fillers. Not all the fillers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that's not a bad idea actually. Yeah. Okay. So let's kind of get into your book that you wrote. Number one, why did you write the book? And tell us a little bit about what's in it. What, what does someone expect to see? So it is completely nonfiction. It is Harley telling his story. So he is a rescue and he goes through his entire kind of journey about being rescued, being afraid that he might be given up. Um, especially after he gets diagnosed with diabetes Mm -hmm. Um, and then learning about unconditional love. And through his journey, he meets other animals with special needs. So we have a blind and deaf dog named Otis that he meets. We have a three-legged dog named uh, Hope that he meets. And it is, it's geared towards children. It's a very basic um, children's book, but I just, I feel like adults need it as much as kids. So Again, it started back, we talked about it before with the diagnosis and finding out that so many pets had to be put down because I thought, Mm. wow, if I can save one animal and one pet parent um, from having to lose their animal when they could have been treated. Yeah. Um, So that was part of it. Um, Another piece of it was kids feel so alone when they get diagnosed with and their special needs, especially diabetes, type one diabetic kids, um, there's so much they have to do and so much that sets them apart. You know, kids just want to feel like they belong and like they're not different than anybody else. And you have a diabetic kid. And nowadays with the continuous glucometers, it helps parents, it helps kids. Everybody gets to be a little more comfortable, but they still, they don't get to do sleepovers the same way another kid would do. Um, so I really wanted them to know, look, you're not, you're not alone. Animals can have the same health issues that you do. And there's a ton of rescues because understandably some people can't afford pets with special needs. They just aren't able to continue to care for them. And I get that. I understand that there are a lot of resources available for financial help. Um, I should have these at the tip of my tongue and I don't, I can email you, Um, There's one in California that I know about where if you're financially unable to care for your special needs pet, you can apply for a grant to have help um, caring for them. Um, But there are also a lot of rescues that take in these special needs animals. Um, Mm. Best Friends Animal Sanctuary is one of them. Um, There's an older dog rescue. Um, I actually listed some of them for myself. So um, the gray muzzle organ is called graymuzzle.org because as pets age, family members give up their pets as they get older, which is really heartbreaking and devastating. I have my friend, Christina runs a place called deaf dogs rock and they help deaf dogs find forever homes. So I also wanted people to be aware of the fact that there are places, if you have the heart for it, there are places to rescue special needs pets. Um, and they are so forgiving. They teach us unconditional love, like nothing else can, you know, an animal that's been abused by humans can be so forgiving of humans and just love their next family, no matter how awfully they were treated before. So, um, I wanted that that's kind of, that's a really long way around saying what Harley's story is about. He's a rescue dog who ends up with special needs, meets others with special needs and learns to overcome his fears to figure out what a forever family and unconditional love looks like. And and you kind of brought up the bullying aspect. Talk a little bit about that, about like children with diabetes, the the bullying and, or or a child that's different period. Mm -hmm. And you kind of used that in your book a little, talk a little bit about that. 
I do. Um, in fact, I never wanted to be an author that just came to a school. Obviously with COVID, I haven't been able to go to any schools, but I didn't want to be a children's author. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it, but you know, there's, there are, off, I didn't want to just go and read a story. I wanted there to be more to my visit than that. And it took me a while to find the niche. I just, I, I knew I would know it when I found it. And my girlfriend works at, um, for Wayside Waves in Kansas City for a rescue there. And they have a whole no more bullying program. And so I was able to tie in with them. And I have a workbook that goes along um, that from them, different age levels for that, that teaches kids. We know research shows that bullying is about power. Mm -hmm. It's about feeling like you're not worthy. And so therefore you're going to turn and you're going to turn that on to somebody that is less powerful than you. True. And so oftentimes where that starts is with an animal and, or with a child that is different than you that has special needs. Um, so they're at higher risk dogs and, and children with special needs are at higher risk. Um, so I, in partnering with wayside waves, I'm able to bring it. There's a seven day official program that goes along with the workbook. And then I've narrowed it down to a one day program as well. And it teaches seven different aspects of responsibility and compassion and being humane self-control, integrity, respect, and courage wow. to help kids learn those things. Cause if you can, if you can change that, if you can take that kid who maybe got beat down at home or, you know, my kids that come from tough places, if you can take those kids and you can teach them to have self-respect, to have courage, to use their words, to have integrity. If you can stop that cycle, we can stop the cycle of bullying. Mm. And animals are a great way to teach that. They're one of, they're, you know, again, they're very, very forgiving. They love us no matter what. And, um, and so bringing a, an animal, that animal aspect into that program also helps kids feel less intimidated by the whole conversation as well. I love that. And I do think that is so important. I mean, get them when they're young and uh, bullying. Oh God. Oh, I, that is one thing I just couldn't tolerate when, when I was younger. I, I remember I, I was a little, one of the, the smallest kids in the class always never the smallest but like number two number three kind of but boy you did not bully around me I didn't care how big you were because I was going to get in the middle of it my poor mom she'd get a phone call oh god what did she do what did she do Amber was in the middle of it again. again she's protecting go, another kid, kid though <laughs> I was like what do you think you're gonna do you're like this big but whatever mm -hmm. but I hate that I hate bullying that just breaks my heart and cruelty to animals no just no 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 mm -hmm. no just no but that does happen like you said it dogs get it, and when they're different mm -hmm. and they have those needs I, I see a little somebody in the background Oh, is there a dog back there? <laughs> yes. She's been at my, she's been at my feet actually trying to get, trying to get up. Do you want to see the current rescue? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. She, when she comes back, <laughs> Sierra, she, when she comes back, I'll get her on. Oh, here she, Sierra. She just got groomed today too. So she's actually looking. Oh, nice. Come here. Come here. Come here. Oh, the other kids are in bed. Oh, hi. That's our current <laughs> little girl. Oh, she's cute. I'd show you mine, but uh, yeah. She can't probably, quite lift him up to the camera level. Yeah, she's probably about 90 pounds or so right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's our current. And we got her. I had been volunteering for a rescue for a while when my last dog went to the Rainbow Bridge. And mm -hmm. I knew they knew I, we wanted another dog, but I didn't want the next animal to come into the home before kids did. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to set the rescue up for failure. Cause even if, um, they were used to children, if you bring a rescue into a ho household with only two people in it, you set them up, they're going to be resource. They're going to start resource guarding their family. Um, and they're not going to let kids come in. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, I'm going to hold off. I'll wait. 
me without a dog is not something I like yeah, to be, yeah. <laughs> but I'll hold off. I'll wait. Cause I got to do what's best for the animal. So I did. And I just kept volunteering for a rescue. And when we brought the four children into our home, again, they're four siblings. When they moved in, they were one, two, three, and four. So when we brought the four siblings into our household, um, the rescue, like a month later said, well, we have a dog that we think was a puppy mill escapee and she just had puppies. Do you want one of the puppies? And I went, I can't do puppies and I, I can't do a puppy. And they said, well, the mom needs a home too. And we know she did really, really well with all other animals and kids. And she has been the best thing for my kids, Amber. Mm. She teaches them to be gentle. Mm. Um, you know, they, they can be pretty rough. We got three boys and a girl and they rough and tumble play together and rough and they want her to rough and tumble play with them. She lets them know very, very nicely that I remember when they were first yeah. in, yeah, oh yeah. I would hear her in the background when she first came in. Cause obviously they all kind of came together. Most people thought I was insane. You, you took in four small children and now you have a brand new dog. Like, what are you thinking? <laughs> but I had four months off of work. I'm like, I can be there. I can monitor everything. So I would hear her in the background, start to kind of grumble. And I'd be like, Sierra's saying, no, thank you. Where, I don't know who, where you are. Sierra's saying, no, thank you. <laughs> Yes, I know. I, I know that. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, my two dogs, as old as they are, uh, they're like uh, 12 and 13 or 13 and 14. I might have missed a year somewhere in there, but they're older. And uh, like I said, one of them's almost deaf and the other one is blind diabetic. But my two year old grandbaby is all over them, just like all over them. And we're always saying, you have to be nice. Remember, dogs can still bite, use their teeth, you know. And, and so we have to kind of talk to her that way. But those dogs are so good with her. And I'm like, wow, especially not being able to see or hear or whatever, you know, it kind of makes right. you they can't hear the toddler this. coming at them. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> But they're so good. There's another really good children's book. Um, it's called May I Pet Your Dog? So oh, since you have yeah. a young child in your, you know, your grandchild. Oh, that's a good idea. Because pe people don't seem to teach their kids about approaching strange dogs. And I have a lot of friends that have reactive dogs. Ooh. And so, you know, their dogs are great with them. They're great. Their, their dogs are great with their children, but they're very reactive. And so you mm -hmm. can't just approach their dog. And I love the book because it talks, it talks you through, may I pet That's your dog? That's a good idea. I should get that. Um, I, I'm the worst. She really doesn't want to, you know, emulate me because I'm one of those people <laughs> I'd say hi to a dog before a person oh, and I'd be the one hanging over the fence, trying to pet the dog, you know, can't pet that dog, can't pet that dog. You know? mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I, I, I usually, we used to joke around at our pet blogging conferences that I remembered the pet's names before I remembered the owner's name. <laughs> yep. So yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, do you know that well, you wouldn't know this, but we went to New Orleans one time and we're walking down the street and there's all this stuff going on. This is pre-COVID, you know, mm -hmm. when you could do stuff and, you know, the bands and stuff. And you had a lot of homeless people. Well, there was one guy, he had a dog. It was a beautiful dog. And he was carrying his little, you know, pushing his little buggy, his little shopping cart with all his stuff. And, and he had the dog with him. Of course, me being who I am, I'm like, oh, puppy, ah, you know, and so I wanted to pet the dog or whatever. And then he was like, oh, okay, just ignore me. I see like that, like it was an insult because he was homeless or something. It was like, no, I just like dogs better than humans. Sorry. <laughs> Had nothing to do with your situation. Like you could be oh, the mayor. Sorry. You could be the mayor yeah. of this town. And oh, I'm yeah. still going to ask you care. to test your dog first. <laughs> I don't care if you're Brad Pitt. I would still be right. all over the dog. You know? Your dog. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. No insult, but your dog, I'm, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me, let me see. Let me, let me make sure I've got all these. Um, oh, okay. We didn't cover this. What dietary changes do you make for a dog with diabetes? I guess we talked about the raw, but mm -hmm. you are doing something different than what I'm doing. 
so how 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 did you approach that since you said you didn't do broth? I did go to grain free and I did mix it. Um, I mixed it with um, like you said, I even the canned dog food can cannot be great. Mm-hmm. Um, but I ended up mixing it with canned dog food and I did some rotation of the main protein in it. Um, there's, you know, like you said, our dogs weren't really made to have grains. They ate raw that that's what wild mm-hmm. dogs ate was raw. So I did the best I could at the time mm-hmm. I could do better now, <laughs> um, with, with doing that and looking for the higher higher quality. And then, and you can buy raw nowadays as well. There are companies that do it, but it is Mm. so expensive. Is it? I was going to look into that. I I mean, you may want to supplement some of it with it. Um, and maybe it's not as, maybe it's not as expensive as it was back when I looked into it before. Um, but you still don't have the control you have if you're making your own. Yeah. But yeah, I true. did, I did, um, I did a mixture of, um, it, w- and I, I used halo is the, is the brand I used. And then I actually found, um, another one that I could do rotating when I ended up with a dog with allergies, I kind of rotated through with that. So I do have a blog post on choosing pet food, um, that isn't raw food based. Cool. But that's what I ended up doing. I ended up looking for no byproducts um, the best I can. I know Dr. Harvey's has some really, really great stuff. Um, I'm trying to think there's, there's a couple of different brands that actually do a really good job of keeping it with human grade, human grade ingredients. Cause that's what you're looking for. If you're not yes. going to go raw, you're looking for human grade ingredients. Um, you don't want the artificial preservatives. You want nutritious. You want the human grade you want to make sure that your dog's digestive system doesn't get upset. You can watch. I mean, I, I know it's a funny thing and it's actually an advertisement for Halo, but the proof is in the poop. <laughs> so your story. if it's, if it's, yeah, if you keep an eye on that as gross as that may sound to some people, mm-hmm. um, that's what you're going to be looking for. You don't want them to have diarrhea. You don't want it to be too hard. You know, you're going to, you're going to look at that and you want recognizable ingredients, right? Like that's what a whole lot of people Uh, don't realize that they're looking for is you really want the ability to recognize what, what's in that food. So, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of places out there that do it. There's, um, you just have to do your research. For sure. And I've got a lot of, after I had gone to a few of these pet blogging conferences is that's where I really met like Kimberly for, you know, keep the tail wagging and Carol Bryant is, she had the easiest post for me to just go through and kind of look at it. But Carol Bryant, um, both have been in this, in, you know, this kind of pet space for a really long time. Um, and that's kind of where I learned so much more than I ever knew. And, but I only got into this after I wrote the first edition of Harley story, which the second edition that's coming out on March 30th is it's the same story, but it's reorganized and it's got pictures that are, I've got illustrations mixed with actual pictures of him as he tells his story. Um, so I, I am really, really, really proud of the second edition and it's, it's the, it's going to be the first in a series. I have a series that's, oh. that I'm going to do with life lessons from fur friends. Oh, I like that. <laughs> that is real cool. Okay. Well, is, was there anything that you wanted to talk about that I, that we didn't go over? I think, oh, you know what, Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about pet adoptions. Oh, yeah. Because you're, you're very passionate about that. Talk a little bit about that. And, and, specifically about uh, adopting a pet with special needs. Yes. So as I had kind of mentioned just briefly, there are some organizations that actually take in pets with special needs, Um, specifically places like Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. Um, You've probably, I don't, some people may have not heard of them, but they helped with the no-kill shelter movement. Mm. Um, And they have a, oh my goodness, what state are they in? Because I went to them. I actually went and volunteered for them for three days and it was one of the best They, but they have horses, they have cats, they have, 
um, they have rabbits, they have birds, they do everything. So they're amazing. Um, and then places like graymuzzle.org where they take in older rescues. I mean, what it, it can be heartbreaking, right? Like we all know what it's like to lose an mm-hmm. animal. So it's kind of how I looked at how I look still at nurses that do hospice. Thank mm. the Lord for the nurses that do hospice. Mm. We need them. It's such an important thing. You know, if you take in an older dog or you take in a dog with special needs, their life expectancy is not going to be as long, but right. think about, I mean, when I look at the older dogs on their website and I just think I could just give this, this dog a warm place to sleep at night with knowing the unconditional love that they have shared with us for so long. And then again, my friend, Christina runs the deaf dogs rock. So there's deaf and she, you know, she specifically, um, I had a dog that started to lose his hearing and I went straight to Christina and I'm like, okay, before he loses his eyesight too, help me start learning to teach him sign language. Like, where do I go? And she gave me research, research places. Um, and then there is pets with disabilities.org. That's another, um, online site, um, for looking at, at rescue and looking at helping. Um, and again, I will send you a link that you can, because I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but if you have a pet that ends up with special needs, or you would like to be involved in rescuing pets with special needs, um, there are ways to get help. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, that's something that I kind of wanted to do, but I don't think I could handle it. I'll be honest with you. I really don't because Mm -hmm. like when you go in a place like that, it's heartbreaking. Yes. But I'm the type of person who would be like, Oh, Oh, hell no. They're coming home with me. Every one of them come on, Mm -hmm. you know, and load them up in my car and take them home. And then my husband would divorce me, but whatever. How come I have one dog (laughs) when I married my husband in 2010, Harley had just been diagnosed with diabetes and my poor husband had been in a household that had been farm animals. They weren't part of the family did not live in the house Um, and then he meets me and marries me and the dog is in the bed and now the dog has diabetes. So our life revolves around shots. He literally got diagnosed the month before we got married. Wow. (laughs) We have a life that completely revolves around a dog and he'd never had a dog live inside the house. So he is a saint. Wow. Wow. He is. My husband's just, he's really and truly just as bad as me. He, he, I think is probably more attached to our dog, especially now her being blind and diabetic. Mm -hmm. He goes out of his way and she's kind of, uh, she was my dog, but now she hangs with him because she feels safer with him. Mm-hmm. for whatever reason it is that she just, and when he's not here, she gets really upset. Mm-hmm. And he was gone for two weeks in Colorado hunting and she was a nervous wreck. And by the time he got home, her blood sugars were out of control. And that's another time we had to deal with getting it back under control, right. but it was because her, her stress level was so incredibly high. Mm-hmm. People stress. I'm just telling you stress humans, dogs, doesn't matter. Stress is, a we release cortisol when we're stressed. Yeah. Stress, stress, stress. It's mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So bad. And I'm dealing with that myself with my cortisol. I'm like trying to figure out a way to manage that. It's like diet on point, you know, got all this other stuff on point, but then stress. Nah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can't just say brain don't stress. Like that doesn't work. So yeah, not, not so good. No, doesn't happen yeah. that way. No, no, but stress is, is, is rough for animals mm-hmm. too. And that's mm-hmm. the other reason we were, we were thinking about doing the, the glucose curve mm-hmm. at home. Cause we do have a meter and mm-hmm. we are home. And because if she was to go to the vet, like I, I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. she gets so high, strong and nervous and she can't see, she doesn't know where she's at. It's not right. And she doesn't have us. And she, she's never alone. And so th- I figured that would be way too much stress on her. So I'm hoping if we have to do that, we can do it at home, but we'll see. Yeah. So she's, it sounds like she would do better at home. I think so. Yeah. She likes to be with us. I mean, what dog doesn't, they want to be with their family. They but, do. Yeah. yeah. And we're, okay. we're, we are Sierra's litter. So she stresses out when we're not all together. 
Yeah. It, 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 well, that's, what's bad about this whole COVID thing, you know, being at home more like my husband now works from home. My mother lives with us. So, and then I have my grandbaby. So we're home like all day, you know? Mm -hmm. And so she's not one of those dogs that I've always been home. So she's used to somebody being home all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, way too much stress to like move her out. Okay. Let's look before we go, let's uh, talk a little bit about your book as far as uh, you kind of mentioned when it's coming out, talk about that again, where it's going to be available and all, all the, the details stuff, all the details. So from March 30th to April 6th on Amazon, the Kindle version will be 99 cents. I will, I'm going to drop the price for that first week of the launch. Um, but it is available on Amazon. Um, it, because there's two versions of it, you want to look for not like the others, Harley story, um, life lessons from fur friends. I believe that's how they have it listed. Um, because both versions are on there, but I'm the second version. You're going to like it better. (laughs) (laughs) Not that anybody ever had complaints about the first version, but it's, it's definitely an edited upgraded version of it, Um, but it will be on discount for April 30th or April 30th, March 30th to April 6th on Amazon for the Kindle version. All right. I'll have to get me a Kindle version. Is it going to be in print at all or is it going to stay on Kindle? It's in print as well. Oh, okay. Um, it, it is actually both will be available on March 30th. Oh, so, okay. um, and the print version is nine ninety nine. Okay. Very good. Very cool. Okay. Do you have any last minute words about somebody who may be questioning if their dog has diabetes now after mm-hmm. listening to this, what, what steps would you tell them? What, and, and, you know, we talked about what to look for, but any last minute words for, for somebody who is a little worried they might have a diabetic dog? Well, I would look at the last time your pet had labs because just your basic chemistry. So, you know, when we take Sierra in for her dental cleanings, cause small dogs can pass away from dental infections. And so we take her in for her dental cleanings. She is really trying to get up right now. So I'm going to take one more second and put her in my lap guys. Um, so they do basic panels of blood work when they're getting their dental cleanings done. So you can look back and see when was the last, oh, I'm going to lose. You're going to take out my headphones. Um, when was the last time they had a any blood work done and then take a look, the glucose level is on there. So if you're concerned about that and then, you know, watching liver, she's going to totally mess up our entire end of this thing here. (laughs) Um, okay. You've got to get down. You're going to knock off my microphone too. (laughs) Um, so look at the last set of labs. Um, if you're worried about it, I would always call your vet. Um, that's the best thing you can do is get your pet in to see the vet, but your vet could also look back and see, okay, we ran blood work at this time. We did a urine specimen and there wasn't glucose in the urine at this time. So, but there are other disorders like Cushing's disease, um, like Addison's disease, which is the opposite of Cushing's, um, thyroid disorders. You know, these are all autoimmune based disorders, including the diet, you know, well, diabetes has, you know, we just talked about, there's kind of several different ways of looking at that, but, um, that's what I would recommend. Look back, see when the last set of labs were done. If your glucose level was fine, you know, then you're also looking at, um, liver function testing. Cause those tend to go up with Cushing's and some other disorders as well, mm. but talk to your vet. If you're worried, talk to your vet. Don't wait. Don't wait. Yes. I, was I think that's say. the biggest piece of information is yes. don't wait. Yes. Um, even if you get them in there and it's nothing, it's better to be nothing. And if you have a vet that makes you feel guilty for talking about it or asking the questions, then maybe See ya. start vet shopping. <laughs> Cause you want a vet who's willing to take your concerns and listen to your concerns yes, and, and address them and not make you feel ridiculous for asking the question. Absolutely. hundred percent agree. And that goes for your doctor too. Yes. I tell my patients all the time when they're establishing, I say, look, I'm going to be one of the most important relationships that you have. If I'm not somebody you feel like you can talk to and be honest with, or I'm not somebody you feel like you can trust 
at any given time in this relationship, I want you to find somebody that you can. So <laughs> that's a sign of a good practitioner right there <laughs> for sure. Well, Denise, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on and helping to bring more awareness to this, the whole diabetes thing. <laughs> Well, thank you for putting it out there too. I appreciate Mm -hmm. the fact that you're sharing it as well. Awesome. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. And I hope to talk to you more later. Definitely. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. Bye.